population here in New Brunswick is, uh, again, it comes from all walks of life. That there are lots of women who are, are new to our country, who don't speak uh, English, and we have many uh, patients who come from the academic environment since we're part of the Rutgers uh, University campus. Oh. The challenges of serving in a, a, a population that's very diverse is obviously access to care, uh, language barriers, financial barriers, there's lots of barriers. But again, I like to approach medicine and, and care and outreach in a more positive way of how can we knock down these hurdles, how can we jump over them. There's a, a range of women who I care for. Every woman is unique. Every woman has gifts. Well, my mother insists that my defining moment was when I fell off of my bicycle and I gashed my head, <laughs> my forehead, and I was bleeding profusely. When she saw me coming in with a blood-drenched face, she screamed. And I went into the bathroom and I started putting pressure on the gash. I was about seven or eight when I had this uh, accident falling off of my bike mm -hmm. and uh, basically took care of myself and I didn't know I was doing it, but I was doing the right medical maneuver. I put pressure on the wound. I got at this position by, I think, overcoming hurdles and I can think back to fourth grade. I told my fourth grade teacher that I really wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to help people. And my teacher said to me, which has stayed in my brain forever, oh, you mean you want to work in a doctor's office? And I said, I don't think I said that. I think I said I wanted to be a doctor and help people. She said, now, now, now. I'm sure you'll be a very successful person working in a doctor's office. I'm a product of the 1960s, and at that time, most families thought that it was really important for the boys in, in the family to go on and get a higher education. When I look back on my, especially my early childhood, that there were so many people who discouraged me. I should stick with more of the secretarial, and I did take some secretarial because the pressure was so great on me. But actually it's turned out to be okay because now I'm a phenomenal typist. <laughs> but these are the messages, these are the hurdles that many women, myself included, have been bombarded with. Women get it their entire life, that discouragement for just not following their dream or, or not going to the next level. And that's why it really takes mentoring your entire life. Those support people that you can bounce off ideas on and, and make sure that uh, you're thinking objectively and that you're also thinking with vision and having vision. There has to be a limit to how many children a woman can have. As soon as a woman gets pregnant in one of these experiments, she's treated like a common criminal. She can't get an abortion. Was when I became a, a physician and, and looked into what are some of the research issues that have to be addressed that I found there was a great void in sexual expression and being able to talk about sexual health in the medical community. There had to be people like myself that could move this, the area ahead. The contraceptive revolution, which obviously freed women and their partners from unwanted pregnancy, certainly was an exciting area. My involvement in the contraceptive revolution was that I worked on uh, the original oral contraceptive pill. I wasn't protesting, but I was making sure that as a resident in training, as a medical student, and then as an attending, that I was furthering the research in the area and the options for women and for their loved ones. I've seen great strides made in the area of sexual health, both for men and for women, and I'm very happy to have been one of the pioneers in that area. Delivering a baby is the most joyous event in the world. 
There is nothing that compares to it. It's bringing a new life into the world with, with new hope, with new joy. It's indescribable. It is a surge of, of positive energy. I'm sure it's like a runner's high. I'm not a runner, so I don't know what the endorphin high feels like when you've raced for three or four miles. But delivering a baby is the most joyous event that I could think of. When I deliver a baby and the baby has a defect, I never throw in the towel. And maybe you can say that this is a Pollyanna aspect of me. How can you put a, a price, how can you measure the love that someone feels for a baby that's defective or a baby that lives six months or a baby that lives to 106? Do I feel sad? Of course I feel sad. Yeah. And I've had my shares of going into the, the women's room and crying. It's, it's okay to cry, and I tell residents that as well. It's not okay to cry when you're in the situation, but after the situation, when you're in a private area, that you, you, you can cry. When I was a very young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed uh, professional, I encountered my first patient who died in childbirth. I was very sad to have this little baby and his mom dead. And I cried uh, almost um, an hour after everything was done. You're not going to totally separate your feelings from the medical situation, but while you're in the medical situation, you take care of the problem, and then afterwards, your human side comes out. I'm very, very happy with what I'm doing. I think I'm a cheerleader, and maybe that's why my son went into cheerleading. That as soon as I get up in the morning, I'm already thinking about all the, all the exciting things that I'm doing. For instance, when I got up today, I was so anxious to meet you. <laughs> Made me feel like this was going to be such an amazing day, and it is. And I think it's probably my being a cheerleader and, and looking at the day with a very positive outlook, which I think makes everything brighter. My name is Gloria Bachman. I'm a physician at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, and right now I'm interim chair of the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences, as well as the Associate Dean for Women's Health.